Well, let me start at the beginning. I was born on a warm night in Shanghai. <laughs> no. Well, we had time together, but not time for the whole story. But in fact, that is where the story starts. His family for years had business in China, and at the outbreak of war with Japan in 1937, they had to move to San Francisco. Peter was a year old. It's all in his autobiography, Driven by Nature, a personal journey from Shanghai to botany and global sustainability. But the story of Peter Raven is still unfolding at the age of 85. It seems to me that although you've been retired officially for a while, you're still working on stuff. Do you have projects yet that you've got to finish up? Well, I've had a long, happy life, and I've taken up a lot of projects and areas and things in it. And actually, I'm still working on some projects in California that I might have started when I was 12 years old. As a boy, he was something of a prodigy when it came to botany. And with the help of teachers and mentors, he was doing field work. Here he is, just 14 years old. I really enjoyed it. But my first thought was probably to teach high school and keep doing it as a hobby. I wasn't ready to plunge into it professionally at all. But by college and graduate school, he had taken the plunge. Well, there are a couple of stages. I was first really focused on the plants of California. I began then working on the evening primrose family based on an exciting discovery of one in the Presidio in San Francisco. And that, in turn, led me to New Zealand to look at other members of the same family. And, and going to New Zealand really opened a worldwide view for me. Then when I came back, and particularly when I moved to St. Louis 50 years ago this year, 71, I began to think about plants on a worldwide scale. Peter Raven's impact on the garden is well known, guiding its development with a new master plan. The Japanese garden was added. He built its budget, its staff, and its profile, and not just as a local attraction. One of the most important parts of the Missouri Botanical Garden is something few visitors see, but is well known by botanists and researchers the herbarium is a huge library of dried plants from around the world. In the Missouri Botanical Garden, uh, we had about uh, two million when I got here, and we have about seven million now. And they keep coming in. And they keep coming in. It's one of the best in the entire world. Uh, so it's not only very important as an index to cataloging and sorting out the wonderful diversity that supports the productive capacity of the Earth's ecosystems, but it's increasingly and unfortunately a repository for pieces of extinct organisms that we assume people will be able, will want to know about for centuries into the future. So saving them is very important. But even if he had never come to St. Louis, Peter Raven would still have made his mark. In the world of botany, there's his work on the evening primrose. Students know his name from his textbook, which is still in use. And when he was at Stanford, he and Paul Ehrlich did groundbreaking work describing the process of coevolution, where two different species, say a plant and an insect, will evolve in tandem in response to each other. But it was at the Missouri Botanical Garden that the scientist became a public and even a world figure, an advocate for the environment, for the earth, a man described as a global evangelist for sustainability. We've all got a lot to do, and I think this is um, the message that I've gotten from reading the book and some of the other things yes. that you've done. There's, I don't mean you and I individually running out of time, but I, I get the sense that the Earth might be running out of time. Well, the Earth is tending to run out of time. When I was born, we had fewer than one out of three people for every one we have now. and. There are very few scientists in the world who've thought about it who think the world can accumulate the number of people that are in it now. The problem is we're using up the productive uh, abilities of the Earth in, in uh, food and air and pollution, and all those things, faster than they can be reinforced or renewed. With that, we've got to make some pretty drastic steps to be able to get along into a sound future the thing people have to remember about science is it's not a bunch of theories. You know, somebody once said to 
do you believe in global warming to a scientist? He said, no, I reserve belief for really important things like religion. Uh, global warming isn't a belief, it's, a, it's an assessment of hypotheses that have been made about an area of science. That's why it's so extraordinarily important to educate our children, grandchildren and all, about science and what it really is and how it works. You mentioned in your book so many people that helped you, mentored you, inspired you, collaborated with you. I imagine there must be hundreds if not thousands of people who would say the same thing about you. I find my greatest joy in life, in fact, the only real purpose of uh, living is to love and help other people. And that anything that you learn or, or gain or achieve in your life comes through other people. That's how, regardless of your religious beliefs, you really form a kind of immortality by helping other people to carry on the important messages and developments that you yourself might be able to make. And it's given me my joy and my purpose all my life. And yes, there are very many people, and it's very gratifying to me to know that. For Living St. Louis, I'm Jim Kircher.